Welcome back. Appreciate your patience as we switched over to talk about bonds. Uh, the, the name of the chapter is Long-Term Liabilities. Primary co uh, conversation is going to be on bonds. Um, the bonds represent a financing structure. So this chapter, similar to the last one, really relates to finance. Finance in itself is its own topic. Okay, so for those of you who are majoring in accounting or majoring in business or majoring in some other subject, like mortuary science or whatever, uh, finance is a course that uh, I recommend that you take if you haven't already, um, uh, corporate finance is, is very different from accounting. It's a, it's its own subject. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, for those of you who are going to pursue the bachelor's and eventually the master's and all that, I, I do encourage you to take a course in finance. In most cases it'll be required, especially at the bachelor's and, and master's levels. But I, I would strongly encourage you to do so. I, I think you'll find a lot of value in understanding how corporate finance works. So with that, let's talk about uh, long-term financing, also known as long-term liabilities. Uh, and you, we're going to talk a lot about bonds, which is a form of financing. So we talked about stocks in the previous chapter, previous recording. About stocks from the company's ability to raise funds by issuing shares of ownership in the company, also known as stocks. And now I want to talk about bonds. Bonds are another form of financing, another form of raising cash. The difference is a bond is kind of like a form of a loan, short term loan that are bought and sold on what we call bond exchanges. And individuals like yourselves, you have the ability to buy bonds. These bonds are a form of, of financing for a business. In most cases, you probably heard about bond issuance from local and state and federal governments. The government governments issue bonds to the public in order for the government to raise cash. And they usually do this for things like infrastructure investment or other larger projects that the government's working on. So that's maybe where you heard about bonds in the first place. Let me talk about bonds and bond financing. So projects oftentimes need a lot of money to get started. That's why governments oftentimes will issue what's called a bond. A bond is where the issuers promise to pay par value of the bond plus interest. It's kind of like a short-term loan. You, the individuals, are the bank when it comes to bonds. And the borrower is the government or is the company issuing the bond. The borrower, the company, or the government Promises to pay you, the bond holder, face value of the bond plus interest. It's kind of like a short term loan. It works the same way, very similar anyway. So, this slide shows us uh, in a very simple way how bond financing works. The corporation issues the bond. 
The investors purchase the bond. The corporation promises to pay the bondholders, the investors, the bond plus interest. Throughout the life of the bond, the corporation or government pays the bondholder interest payments over time. And then at the end of the bond, when the bond matures, face value is paid. See? So in other words, the investor buys the bond from the corporation. The investor receives interest payments over time. And then at the end of the bond, they receive the face value. That's how it works. So how the bond interest payments calculated? Each interest payment is based off of the face value, par value, times the interest rate, times time. Again, very similar to short-term loan. Note. A couple of advantages and disadvantages of bonds, bond financing. Advantages. Bonds don't affect ownership. Just because the company owes individuals money, it doesn't affect ownership of the company. Yep. It's an advantage for the company. The interest on bonds is tax deductible. Just like loans are. And bonds can increase return on owner's equity. Absolutely. Disadvantages. Bonds require periodic payments. Interest. And at the maturity date, par value needs to be paid. And of course, bonds can decrease the return on owner's equity. Because the more bonds that the company issues, the higher the liability is, which of course decreases owner's equity. This is what a bond looks like. The company certifies that whoever the bondholder is receive interest payments. And the matures at a certain date, at which date the bondholder will receive uh, the face value of the bond. Leland. Uh, professor, uh, when you said the advantages and disadvantages of bonds, were you, you were speaking in the spec perspective of the, the person who issued the bond, right? Correct. Uh, what would you say would be the advantages and disadvantages of someone who would say, yeah, I'm interested in, you know, a bond? Using it? Yeah, exactly. What would you say is the advantage or disadvantage of that? Yeah, so for the bondholder, the advantages are you receive interest payments over the life of the bond on a quarterly basis, typically, or half a year, full year. Here you either receive interest payments quarterly or semi-annually, depending on the, the bond indenture, which is the agreement between the, for the bond. So that's an advantage because you're receiving interest payments. The other advantage is you're, re you're receiving the face value at the end of the bond. The way I like to think about these kind of things, Leland, is... Uh, a bond acts a very similar way to what you might know as a certificate of deposit at the bank. A certificate of deposit works the same way, where you, Leland, invest uh, cash into a, a CD, certificate of deposit at the bank, yeah. and uh, you, Leland, receive interest payments from that certificate of deposit over time. And then at the end of the certificate of deposit, you receive your initial investment back. So it so really the advantage works the same way for a bond. 
It's, it's that you're receiving that interest payment over time, and then you're receiving the initial investment back. So that's really the best advantage and probably really the only advantage to buying a bond. Um, it really works the same way as a CD does. At this advantage, um, you're paying the money up front you know, to, to buy the bond. And so that would obviously be, be a disadvantage. So those are the things you would have to weigh out in your mind when you come to make a decision to buy a bond or not. Yeah, excellent question. Also, Professor, is I'm guessing the bond, although it's probably safer, is it the upside not as big as, say, investing in stock and stuff like that? Correct. It's like yeah, yeah, absolutely correct. Yeah, so when you buy a bond, the interest rate is what it is. It might, it's probably not going to be as high as when the stock market goes up, you sell the stock. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So the stock market, obviously, very risky. A bond is like very little risk. In fact, there's really no risk. Mm -hmm. um, because because the possibility of the company going out of business or the government going out of exactly, business. Exactly, the government. It's kind of slumped yeah. to none. Yeah. Yeah, I asked only because I was told one time that don't waste your time with bonds. So I was just curious of your opinion. Bonds are safe. I I yeah. like bonds for that reason. So f for somebody like me, um, and this is very age dependent as well. Like so, so like the older you get, you want to do less risky things with your money. Like, like if you're near retirement age, don't be playing the stock market game. That's dangerous. You want to move more into bonds or move move into safer stocks. You don't want to be in these high-risk stocks when you're near retirement because what happens when there's a downturn in the market? Oh, I can't retire now because <laughs> I lost 20% of my retirement in the market, you see. So it's very age-dependent. Personally, for me, I like a little bit of risk and a lot of safety. <laughs> so, so I might be more focused on bonds than I would be on stocks. I always like to have both. You want to have a what we call a di diversified portfolio in your retirement account. Don't just have all your eggs in one basket like they tell you, right? So you want to have some stocks, some bonds, savings account, you know, all these things. Don't leave it all in one basket. Because what happens when that basket sinks? <laughs> you lost it all. So that's why we say diversify your portfolio. Good question. Great, great conversation. Uh, bond trading. Yeah, there's a market for bonds. You buy and sell bonds on the open exchange. Uh, here we have an example of IBM. They sold a bond, uh, and we see some information. We see the yield rate. We see what the bond closed at on the open exchange, 103.8%. Uh, I'm sorry, 0.08%. Um, yeah, so buying and selling bonds on the on the bond exchange? What, well, to, to Leland's point, is, um, the upside is, not as great as it would be with stocks, but uh, it's still a return, and the return is somewhat decent. It can be decent. It depends on the bond that you buy. Now, if you could get a bond and the return is, or the interest rate's 4% or better, that's great. Because if you think about it, the um, S&P 500 index, which represents Different companies, or, or it represents the broader economy, right? I look at the S and P five hundred as an economic indicator, and the average return on the S and P five hundred is between eight and eleven percent. That's the average on uh, uh, annual average. If you could get a return of four percent or better, it's safe. Exactly, it's safe investing. You got it. So, uh, so similar to stocks, bonds are issued at what we call par values. 
And so here we have an example. The company issued a bond at a par value face. Or I'll, I call this face value. Par value is face value. 100,000 in this example. The interest rate's 8%. That's a good bond. The interest rate is paid out twice per year, June 30th and December 31. The bond matures in two years. It's a two-year bond. That means that the company is going to pay interest a total of four times. The bond matures December 31 of this year. So back on December 31, 2021, the company made a journal entry, debit cash, to increase the cash, credit bonds payable, 100000 That represents the bond sold at par. Now, on the first interest payment date, June 30th, we recorded the transaction to pay the interest. How do we figure out the interest amount? We take the face value, par value, times the interest rate, 8%, times time, just like we do with a loan, right? Works the same way. The time, you notice, is half a year. By half a year. Because, according to the bond indenture, the terms, we pay interest every six months which is also half a year. So, face value, 100000 interest, 8%. Point, uh, five, half a year. Equals 4000 Okay. So, bond interest expense, 4000 credit cash, 4000 And we do this on June 30th, and then again, December 31, or... 2022, and then we do the same thing for 2023. Now, at the end of the bond, when it matures, when a bond matures, we call it, it ends. It's the we have to repay the face value. So we debit bonds payable credit cash. At the end of the bond, the maturity date. Now, sometimes. To attract investors in bonds, a company might decide to issue a bond at a discount or a premium. Okay, here's what I mean by this. When a company issues a bond at a discount, it works a little differently. The way it works is Instead of the bondholder receiving the face value of the bond at the end of the date of maturity, instead of that part, it receives a lesser amount because it's discounted. So what this also means is uh, the company receives less. I'll show you what I, what I mean by this. But let's say that uh, you have a bond market of 100000 The company is issuing the bond at 80000 Okay, 20% difference. So 20% discount. The bond issuance is eighty thousand. The company receives eighty thousand. Okay. The company still makes the interest payments to the bondholder. At the face value, the bondholder receives a hundred thousand. It's a way of attracting investment. In the bonds. Another way is where the company issues a bond at a premium rate. A 
premium rate means the bond is being issued above the par value, market value. So if the market value or par value is 100,000, the company might issue that bond at 110,000. So the way that works is that the company receives a hundred and ultimately pays a hundred and ten. You see? That's the concept behind it. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So a discount. Uh value hundred thousand. The issuance price is ninety six point four percent, which is below a hundred, which means it's at a discount. The stated interest rate is 8%. The marked interest rate is at 10%. When the stated rate is below the market rate, we sell the bond at a discount. The reason why this is attractive to bondholders is because still receive the 100000 at the maturity date, the company receives the 96400 You see? So, uh, here's what I mean by this. So here we have company receiving the 96400 discounted. Right? Power value is 100 Company actually received 96400 because it's Hundred times ninety six point four is ninety six four. That's a discount of thirty six hundred dollars. So the company debit cash ninety six four, debit discount on bonds payable thirty six thirty six hundred, and credit bond payable a thousand. Yeah, sorry about that. That's a typo on the slide. Hundred thousand. Bonds payable minus the discount, 96.4 is the, what we call the carrying value. We pay interest. When we pay the interest, it's still at the face value. That's why it's attractive to bondholders. Okay. It's just, it's, and it's broken out by um, the discount amount. So here's what I mean by that. Because the way it works is, the discount, the company is receiving less funds up front, but the bondholders receiving more through the interest payments. Yeah, that's why it's attractive. So uh, we take the way it way it works is we to we find the payment amount, which is face value hundred thousand times the interest rate eight percent times time half a year sixteen thousand is. The four payments of interest, four thousand dollars per payment. Okay, we add discount amount in three thousand six hundred. That means we'll end up paying a total interest expense of nineteen thousand six hundred. We divide that by the four payments to get a total interest payment. Four times of four thousand nine hundred every six months. So, in reality, the bondholder is receiving an additional nine hundred dollars of interest every six months. That's why discount bonds are attractive to bondholders, not necessarily the company. Bonds are amortized over time. Amortization uh, is a schedule-based payment system. And it shows us the decrease in interest over time that's being paid out. Yeah, I think we talked about amortization briefly when we talked about short-term loans or notes. I'm sorry, notes payable. So when we talked about notes payable, we talked about amortization. We're the same way with bonds. It's a schedule. 
When there's bond premium, it means that the bond is being issued above face value. So here we have an example. 1,000 par value. Face value. The issuance price is 103.6%. That obviously is above 100, which means it's being issued at a premium. The stated interest rate is 12%. The market interest rate is 10. That's 2% above market for the stated value, the stated interest. So in other words, again, very attractive for the company and for the bondholder. Transactions. Face value, 100000 The company receives 103600 front. Okay? So that's nice. The company's receiving 3.6% above face value. So we debit cash, 103600 We credit. Premium on bonds payable, 3600 which is the difference between the cash being received and, the, of course, the bond payable of 100000 Uh When the bond uh, is received, debit cash, premium on bonds, credit bonds payable. And this kind of shows us how the, the carry forward amount. Interest payment. This is the fun part. The interest payment. Notice uh, how this works. Four payments. Four thousand face value times interest rate twelve percent times time half a year. Six thousand. Four payments in, in uh, over the life of the bond. Twenty-four thousand dollars total. Now, here we subtract the premium. And the reason for that is because the company received that premium up front. This is a total bond interest expense of 20400 divided by four payments. This is a bond interest expense of $5,100 per, uh, per payment. We... Add in the premium on the bonds payable, and we pay out cash of six thousand dollars per interest period. So you can see both the company and the customer, or bond, I'm sorry, bondholder. Both they both work out. They both do well. And the same amortization type of schedule applies to. Uh, Premium bond. The bonds ultimately retire at the end of their life, the, the maturity date. So to retire a bond, it's a very straightforward type of journal entry. We debit bonds payable and credit cash. This records the re retirement of the bond. That means it's re reached its maturity date, it's done. But sometimes there's a carrying value. If the carrying value is greater than the retirement price, it's called a gain. That means that the company records a gain on the sale of the bond at the end of the bond's life. Okay. And if it sells, I'm sorry, if the bond retirement price is greater than the carrying value, then, of course, it's recorded as a loss. Uh, an example of this looks like this, uh, and this would be for a gain. Debit bonds payable, face value, debit premium on the bond for the amount, credit gain on the bond retirement, and credit cash. In most cases, it ends up being the same amount as the as the bond value when, when they retire the bonds. So that's bonds. Any questions on bonds before we briefly talk about a couple of other long term liabilities? We got bonds? Yes?
Okay, awesome. Let's talk about notes payable. Notes payable, again, works very similar to bonds. So it's a loan. A note payable is a loan. It's a, from the bank. And the company takes out the loan from the bank and has to repay the bank. It's the same way. Yeah, that's a note payable. Note has a maturity date, an issuance date, etc. The uh, borrower typically pays installment payments back to the bank. So when the company takes out the loan, they debit cash and credit what's payable. Of course, we also record the interest rate and the amount of time that we have to pay it back. To find uh, the amount that we have to pay back, oftentimes we use what's called what what is called a present value of an annuity table. This tells us the amount of each payment. Okay, it's a table you. Find the interest rate, and then you find the amount of time that you have to pay in order to find the amount of the payment. See? So here we use an annuity table to find uh, the amount of the payment we need to make uh, for the free payments that we need to make over time. It's kind of complex, okay? We're going to dive, because this is not a finance class, this is accounting, we're not going to dive terribly deep into these annuity payment tables, but I just need you to understand what they are and how they work. Yeah. It's just It really is just a matter of tracing the percent interest uh, and the, the amount of time to find the present value annuity factor, and we multiply that uh, by the dollar amount in order to find the present value. And based on that present value, we are essentially taking the interest rate plus uh, the payable in order to find the amount that we need to pay every single month or every single payment, if you will. That's how it works in a nutshell. Uh, I don't want you to stress too much about that, but I just want you to understand how that works. We do this with notes, but we also do this with mortgages. So with mortgages, as you know, a mortgage is a um, bank loan that is secured by the house. So mortgages are for houses. So when you go to buy a house, well, the first things you do is go to a bank to get a mortgage. And to do that, you typically have a down payment, you have your credit check done, and you secure the loan by backing the loan up with the house. We call that a mortgage. Okay. If you fail to pay, the bank comes to take the house. We call that a mortgage-backed security. Okay, the security part is that if the cut, if the borrower fails to pay, the bank uses the house as the security. So if you fail to pay, it takes the house. That's what a mortgage is, and that's how it works. So, a couple differences. A bond is relatively unsecure. Bonds are not secure debt. What I mean by that is, if the government fails to pay the bond, there's no recourse to the bondholder. Government doesn't go out of business. 
there's no collateral involved. That's bonds. There are unsecured bonds and secured bonds. Unsecured bonds means that there's no guarantee that the bond holder will get repaid. When that happens, when there's no security, the interest rates are higher. Think about like a credit card, okay? Credit card is a form of unsecured debt. With a credit card, there's a higher interest rate associated with it. Like, for example, uh, there's an introductory rate of, you know, 0% for six months or a year. And you use your credit card, and then after that time goes by, there's an interest rate of 18%. And then it goes up to as high as 30%. Okay. Now you might ask yourself, uh, why are credit cards, do they have so high interest? The reason for that is because they're unsecured debt. The bank doesn't have a recourse. So if you stop paying on your credit card, it does a couple things to you. It ruins your credit for one, and it opens you up to be sued, too. But there's no other recourse. It's not secured by collateral. The bank can't come take your house because you didn't pay your credit card credit card is a form of unsecured debt. That's what I'm trying to say. Bonds can either be secured or unsecured. It depends on what it's backed by. Bonds and notes can either be what we call term and serial. Term means that it matures on a specified date. Okay? It's term. At the end of the term, it gets repaid. Serial means that we make periodic payments over time. Usually, we're paying interest twice a year on a bond. If it's a note, we pay interest plus some principal every month. Okay, that's serial. There's multiple payments that we call it serial. For the same amount, we call it serial. Bonds and notes can be what we call convertible and callable. Oh, let me explain this. A convertible bond or loan is when it gets converted into either another loan or it can be converted into stock. Okay? A bond could be converted to stock. We call it convertible. A bond or a loan can also be callable. Oh. When it's callable, that means that the issuer, the bank, has the ability to say it's due right now before maturity. Absolutely. Gotta read the fine print. And then, of course, bond notes are also registered. And there's a bearer. Okay. Registered based off of the um, registration number. And the bearer is bondholder. Bearer means bondholder. Simple terms. And then, of course, a couple of ratios you should know. This one is really important. Banks use this all the time. Okay, especially if you're trying to get a loan. This tells us the riskiness of you trying to get a loan. Or the business trying to get a loan. Okay. It tells us the risk. We take total liabilities divided by total equity. Okay, both these are on the balance sheet, total liabilities divided by total equity. 
Here's the thing. If it's above one, there's some risk involved. Okay. If it's below one, very low risk. Uh, and just to kind of a little bit of recapping, talking about the bonds and the things we talked about earlier. We look at everything over a time frame. Bonds have a useful life. or uh, They mature at a certain date. It's an important to understand the payment based off of whether that bond has a discount or a premium. Sometimes when there's a discount or a premium, we may not actually know the issue and price. And when that happens, we have to use what's called a present value annuity table in order to find the rate okay, based off of the number of periods. And that number, that present value number, we plug that in as a factor. We multiply that by the amount in order to understand the present value. Over the years, this has gotten a lot simpler with a financial calculator. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what a financial calculator is, it has present value features built into it. And there's a lot of them on the internet, so you know, feel free to play with those instead of using these fun tables. <laughs> the same concept works for a premium on a bond, you know, using the present value tables. Uh, and of course, uh, the amortization tables work the same way when it comes to interest or plugging those in and multiplying it by the by the face value and the interest rate. Um, that works for both this kind of premium. And then one of the last things I want to talk to you about today is how to account for leases and pensions. Lease accounting over the years has changed a lot with the introduction of new laws, legislation uh, through Congress when it comes to companies reporting their leases. Leases can either be described as what we call an operating lease, or it could be described as a function lease. So there's really two, or also known as an asset lease. So there's really two types of leases. There's an operating lease and an asset lease. The operating lease gives the lease or the the uh, the owner gives the leasee the right to operate using that lease. Okay. Example of that would be rent. Okay, you're renting the asset from the landlord, the place where you live, in exchange for rent payment, that is a form of an operating lease. Or the leaseor. Another example would be what we call a finance lease, which is where the leasee receives the remaining benefit of the asset. An example of that would be when UDC decides to rent a copy machine from um, from uh, Xerox. That lease agreement. Provide if it's a finance lease, it provides the useful life of that copying machine to UDC. That's the primary difference between those. It's important to understand the difference between finance and operating leases for that reason. Operating lease basically says that you have the ability to operate under this lease. And then the last thing I want to talk about today is called pensions. A pension is a type of retirement account uh, that some of you may or may not be familiar with. If you work for the government or a government entity, you might be.
be enrolled in what's called a pension plan. The pension plan is a benefit provided to employees for retirement. When you put a certain amount of time into the agency, you become what's called vested. When you become fully vested, the agency pays you a portion of your earned income for the rest of your life. Okay, that's called a defined benefit plan, also known as a pension. We talked briefly about pension accounting in previous chapters, but I just wanted to bring that up again because sometimes there's unclarity about pensions and also unclarity about leases. So that's why we talked about those two things in this chapter. But that, my friends, brings us to the end of our discussion on bonds um, and other long-term payables. Are there any comments, questions, or concerns about bonds or other long-term payables? I have a question, but it's not related to uh, the... Go, go for it. Go for it, Leland. I was going to ask you because I was curious about investing. Okay. Um, not about anything specific, but what type of you... Um, are you... A, uh, which type of brokerage co- account like com- should I... like? Should I open one for Fidelity or Vanguard? I'm not sure which one. They're all the which same. One? They're all the same. Huh? They're all the same. Yeah. Is like... they'll, they'll operate the same way. Um, so the way that those tip, those typical brokerage accounts work is that you you will open it up online. Uh, there's usually some fees involved when you do some trades. Um, fees are so low. Uh, a lot of them, especially these days, are real low. Um, it really doesn't matter what, which which firm you decide to work with, whether it's a Vanguard, a Fidelity, a um, Robin Hood, uh, or or whoever. Uh, they they really offer they all offer the same uh, services and benefits. Try, try to find one with the lowest fees, though. All right. Just- one of the lowest type of fee might be beneficial. Okay, got it. I was just curious if there's any major difference. Thank you. No, no, it's just the fees. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> awesome. Elizabeth. Go back on Leland's question. You said you had some free advice on stocks. May I ask what that is? Go for it. What what kind of question do you have on them? I have no question in particular. What you say you have free advice? <laughs> I'm willing to listen to it. Yeah, yeah. So my advice about stocks is that um, never buy in just one type of uh, sector. So if you're like, for example, if you're looking to buying stocks, don't buy in one type of sector. In other words, don't just buy um, IT or or don't just buy social media. Don't just buy um, computers. Don't just buy healthcare. Don't just buy um, transportation. It's good to diversify your portfolio. That's the number one tip I can provide for you when, when it comes to buying stocks. The other advice I would have for you is um, do your homework on the companies that you're buying in. A lot of investors, they make a big mistake when it comes to looking at just just the profit. No, don't just look at the profit. That doesn't tell you enough about the company. When you when you invest in a company, you're when you're purchasing the shares of stock, you want to look at its forward-looking potential. You know what what's the company direction like? Who's leading the company? What does the company care about? Um, I I look at my investing strategy as I look at things from a holistic approach. I, look, I say, you know, would my grandmother buy this stock? You know, those are the things I think about. It's like you you buy things you care about, okay? And things you know. Don't don't buy things you don't know. Um, you know, I, I know about Starbucks. I know about Target. I know about Amazon. I know about these things because I'm a customer. Okay, you're a customer there. It's probably a good reason for you to buy their their shares, um, but don't just do it for that reason. You want to look at the overall performance of the company. 
Don't buy things you don't understand. Stay away from stuff you don't understand. Um, if you feel like there's risk, there is. There's always risk. Every single time you purchase a share of stock, there's risk. There's a risk you could lose your investment. Absolutely. Like the stock could go to zero tomorrow. Absolutely. So understand your risk. Understand your risk tolerance. And what your ability is to to withhold loss. Um, you know, don't you know, make sure you diversify your portfolio. Only invest in things that you know. But stay away from cryptocurrency. <laughs> it is very volatile. So uh, uh, when when things change every second, I don't trust it. Okay, so stay away from that stuff. Uh, Leland, I saw you have. Professor, so I was just wondering for so if you're just starting out, would you suggest maybe an index fund? Something that yes, can... yeah, absolutely. Index funds are safe. Um okay. I like mutual I love mutual funds and I love index funds. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that way it helps to diversify your portfolio and your risk. Yeah. Good question. Okay, so that Liz, that's my advice on uh stocks. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great start. You're welcome. Okay. Any other comments, questions, concerns? Okay. Uh, quick look into the classroom. Uh, yeah, we're in week seven already. For those of you keeping track, uh, there's a. It's amazing how fast time flies. Uh, this course ends next week. Yeah, uh, ends on the fifteenth. So it's only like 12 days away. So if you're late with stuff, don't be late with stuff. Get it all done now, like today. Okay. Uh, week seven, here's what we got going on. And uh, I will fix this. Thank you to Leland for reminding me. Um, Long-term liabilities video annotation, which is not working right now. I will fix that as soon as we end the call today. And of course, we have our uh, chapter 13 quiz and 14 quiz. And those three things you need to complete by Sunday night. I recommend that you take uh, time on Thursday to do that, of course. Um, those are the three things you need to do. Any questions? Okay. All right. Well, I, again, thank you all so much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Appreciate you all hanging out with me and having these cool conversations about stocks and bonds and, you know, things that excite me as a finance and accounting person. Uh, and of course, uh, hopefully you got some, some useful stuff out of this uh, course so far. And, uh, you know, next week's our last week together, at least for this course. Um, so let's finish strong, okay? So so do the best you can. Uh, finish all your remaining work. And um, next week, what we'll do is on Tuesday, we're going to talk about chapters 15 and 16. But we'll also uh, talk about uh, the final exam. And so what I'll do is uh, that'll be three video section, okay? So we'll do 15 and 16, and then we'll do the final exam, and we'll do a review, just like we did for the midterm, okay? So that's how we'll, we'll approach next week. Okay, everyone feel good? Yes, sir. Awesome. Yep. Very cool. Well, thank you all so much for your time today. Appreciate all of you. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can email me, call me, set up office hours, whatever you need. You know I got you. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate all of you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.